Georgie, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yes, wonderful. Absolutely delighted um, to host you today. Robin, how are you, sir? Hi, Chris. I'm cool. Yeah, ready to go. Good, you good. Doing? I like your backdrop. Yeah, well, it hides the boxes behind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, who dares wins? Hide boxes. <laughs> so, our dear friends at home, massive welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. This is a really special edition of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast um, <clears throat> because I have two fantastic guests who, and I think the three of us have a, a shared connection is that we've all fired rifles or shot guns in, uh, in our time. My guests have done a lot more of it than I have, and they're certainly a lot more accomplished. Um, Oh, sorry, forgot the stop, the all important stopwatch. Georgina Robert, uh, Roberts from the British shooting team is going to represent us at the Paris 2024. I've got to write that down because, <laughs> because I don't really watch much television. So, um, yeah, I guess, are they starting to promote that, Georgie, already? Is, is that something that's in the media? Um, so I'm, I'm sure they have done, um, but they'll be making a big push of it much closer to the time, probably once Tokyo is kind of done and out of the way. Yes, good job. We'll come and we'll come and talk more about that in a sec. Robin Horsfall, former um, SAS trooper, one of the legends of the Iranian embassy siege, although he's probably going to tell me not to use that word. Um, very proud paratrooper and also quite an accomplished author. In fact, I think after we've had our chat now, we're going to do a, a second video to talk about Robin's latest book, Warrior Poet, which I've been reading this morning. And um, yes, got a lot to say about that, Robin. It, it's, a, it's a great piece of literature. Um, so yes, Georgie, the Olympics, how, how that it must be a dream come true, isn't it? Yeah, so it's something that I'm still working towards, um, but it's been my dream for the lo maybe last five years, as long as I've been shooting, um, is to be able to go to the Commonwealth, go to the Olympics, and to have so at my performance at the moment is the best it's ever been. Um, I've got kind of new coaches on board, I'm working on different elements like strength and conditioning and nutrition and everything's really coming together uh, to put me in the best place for this next Olympic cycle. So it's going to be hard work um, and there's lots to be done, but I'm, I'm so excited. Oh, well, you, 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 you should be a massive congratulations. Um, what exactly what do you have to do in the event, uh, Georgie? Um, you know, um, what does it involve? Is it a, the fitness aspect to it, a run or what? I mean, don't know anything about it. Uh, no, so Olympic Trap is... Um, an event which is over 125 targets. So there are five stands and there are 15 traps in front of you. Um, and so there's three traps in, like, in front of every single stand. Um, and there's out of the three traps, you've got a straight, a left and a right. So when you call for the target, you don't know which one you're gonna get. Um, and so there's 125 targets in qualification. And then at the minute, when you go into the final, you shoot 50 targets, single barrel, um, and then you have go on to the last three, so everyone drops out, so the lowest score will drop out um, until you get down to the final three. Um, when bronze drops out, it's just the gold and silver medal match, which is 10 targets, and then the winner is... The gold medalist. Yeah. Georgie, what, and I've seen you firing shotguns, mm -hmm. It is, is this the same rifle, uh, weapon? Yes, yeah, so we use 12 gauge shotguns. Mm. Do we call a shotgun a rifle or is no. it? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> call a boat a ship. <laughs> Fail, failed at the first hurdle. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. And Robin, can you tell us a bit about being a trained sniper? So, an, you're tra trained by the Royal Marines. Absolutely, yeah. I was um I was always in the 
from the day I arrived in the parish prison, I was on the shooting team. Uh, even before I joined my battalion, I was straight on the shooting team. And um, so I had an affinity for it. And um, <clears throat> Robin, can you just speak speak up, yeah. up a bit? I, it's gone a bit quiet. Nick, we used to call me Bob when I was in the army. So I got the nickname Bisley Bob. And um, because I was always shooting at Bisley and always talking about Bisley. Um, what, why, is Bis, why is Bisley such a, a name that we all recognise? Well, it was the, it was the, it's the main sh small arms uh, shooting centre in, in UK and all the biggest competitions always used to be held at Bisley and they still are. And, um, but, you know, the, the army only got smaller. It's, uh, it's uh, less so now. But, you know, they've got the ranges. You know, you go, you go back to, you go back to 1,500 metres, um, you know. So it's, um, and, you know, the longest range I ever worked at was 1,200. But uh, when I went to um, the Royal Marines and did the Royal Marine sniper course, um, it's um, snipe. I always divide sniping and marksmanship. Marksmanship is when you can hit a target with a weapon, but being a sniper is about being invisible, hitting a target, and then escaping without getting killed. Um, so there's an awful lot more to being a sniper than being a marksman. But the marksmanship skills are the same. You know the the way you um, the way you function with the weapon, the way you breathe, the way you use your eyes, um, you know, um, we used to do all sorts of things, black in the foresights. I mean, my eyes now, I, I, I struggle to see the foresight of a rifle. But I will say one thing with great respect to Georgino, when I, I was great with a pistol, I was absolutely awesome with a rifle. But when it came to a shotgun, I couldn't hit diddly squat. <laughs> anything, really, I couldn't. Was useless with this were useless when it came to uh, when it came to uh, clay pigeon couldn't hear a damn thing <laughs> yeah we um we uh, when i was on ship i was on ship for an aircraft carrier for a year as one of the marines in the marines detachment and we got quite a lot of range time which was great we also got to fire the 7.62 slr which had gone out of service by the time i joined but was still being used in 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 the navy on 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 board. Um, fantastic to get the different experience between five point five six and seven point six two, especially a long barrel weapon like the SLR. The accuracy over long distance it, it was just completely different. Whereas the S eighty SLR, I could guarantee hitting a man at five hundred meters. Um, yeah. You know, um, whereas. And your section firepower was 600 with a GPMG um, as part of your fire team. As soon as they dropped it down to 225 and uh, the VSA 80, I mean, your, your section firepower is reduced by 250 meters. Um, terrible. Uh, mm. Never ever supported the idea of putting that piece of rubbish into the British Armed Forces. You're talking about the weapon, Georgina, the DSA 80, uh, which is a weapon the British Army still use today. Um, not a supporter of it <laughs> yeah well apparently i don't want to talk too much kind of you know nitty-gritty war stuff but in um, afghanistan the 5.56 wasn't stopping the enemy um uh, apparently if they're high on whatever drug is in favor mm -hmm. over there they, they will just keep coming and so the fssg and and, and the like and the special forces got this shorter barreled seven point Six two. I'm apologies, friends at home. Can somebody put in the comments the, the rifle I'm talking about? Um, just because it had had more more stopping power. Well, but the AK forty seven. Yeah, well, it's a it, it's a similar size weapon. It, it's um, obviously a European European brand, I believe. But the the shotgun anecdote I was going to tell was we were on ship and on the range one day, someone pulled out this pump action shotgun and you could load up 10, 10 cartridges. Um, what do we call them? Cartridges, cases? Yeah. Shotgun cartridge, isn't it? Sorry, my other screens just flipped off. Um, um, we had a chat, Paul, hello, Paul, if you're watching, I'm not going to say your surname, but Paul grabbed this shotgun went up to the target and and they were graciously allowing us to shoot from from five meters or something and he went ch -ch, poof, ch -ch, poof, ch -ch. 10 times i managed to miss every single shot <laughs> <laughs> which is it, it that's almost unique in itself with pump action shotgun to miss from five meters but 
How um, many are you hitting out of uh, how many, Georgina, to get up to the standard you're at? Um, so out of one two five, the minute my personal best is one eighteen. Wow. <laughs> at awesome. the minute, about a one ten would be making a women's final. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the the, the um, technique you use in order in, in in terms of leading the the target and so on. So in Olympic track, there's no lead because the gun movement, obviously when you call for the target, the target leaves immediately, there's no delay. Um, and so it's just based on reaction time and it's the gun speed from the initial movement through to the target. Um, as soon as you reach the target, you pull the trigger. So you don't see any lead. Um, it's just the momentum to the target will obviously pull the barrel in front of the target naturally and um, put it in the right place. Is so lead that's where I was going wrong. <laughs> When you guys say lead, is that, is that if you were clay pigeon shooting and you sort of follow like this or am I misunderstanding? Yeah, so um, so with sporting targets, you would you would give things lead. So if it was a crossing target, you would if this was the target, you would have to pull through the target um, and give it a gap, pull the trigger in front, and then the target will kind of catch yes. up with you and yes, um, catch up with the shot. Um, but with Olympic trap, because they're going away, you, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. So they've got up to 45 degree angles. And, but again, with the, the momentum and the gun speed, you, you don't see that lead. Yeah. I think you're going to have to explain traps again, because I might be speaking for people, well, probably speaking for people at home. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're saying trap, I'm, I'm, am I getting confused with the, the clay pigeon launcher? Yes. That's what a trap is. Yeah, okay, sorry, that's what I thought it was, but I wasn't sure if it was, I'd maybe um, got that mixed up. Yeah, so there's 15 of them lined up in front of you, under uh -huh. the ground, um, and there's three in front of each stand. So you, if you'd stand on peg one, there'd be three directly in front of you. And when you pull, pull, you're gonna get a left, a straight or a right-hand target. Uh, and you're gonna get. Yes, of course, now it makes sense from what I've seen, right, okay. And you're saying it, it wings it out in a straight pretty much a straight direction so you'll just up and shoot yeah so it would be 40 foot between um straight ahead of you to a 45 degree yeah. left and right hand target you don't know which where it's going to go so for a 45 degree would would you have to lead slightly again no because of the gun speed you wouldn't you wouldn't see that it's just so quick yeah, yeah. Okay, right. I'm I'm going to try and put a bit of video footage at the at the beginning of our podcast, just so people will will get a clearer picture. Wow, yeah, and it's, it's, it's the direction as well, because it's going away from you. You don't you, you don't you, the lead wouldn't make any difference. It's it's firing from in front of you, straight away from you. You know, off at, you know within that certain those certain angles. Whereas when you start playing clay pigeon, it goes across the front of you, um, like a bird would. And so you you do have to lead. I, you know, I, I, I understood what it. I understood where you were coming from. Yeah, uh, there's difference between the powers and the brains, mate. <laughs> um, what what about safety, Georgie? In that kind of uh, arena, um, obviously it's as tight as anywhere on on any, any other range. Does it throw up any issues or any or any sort of changes need to be made? Um, so we are very, very safe in the UK. Obviously, everyone's licensed um, and there's always like a, a CPSA safety officer on site somewhere. Um, and most shooting grounds in the UK, you you can't actually just go around by yourself unless you do have that um, shotgun license and you are an experienced shot. So if you are a beginner, um, you'll always be escorted by an instructor and he can make sure that every all the safety precautions are being followed and everyone's going to be. Uh, nice nice and safe as they go around the ground which is 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 great for the sport as well because it means that you know we get so much negative press that we, we wouldn't want any mishaps or any accidents to um to kind of well, damage the sport a... further why do you get negative press uh, just in terms of, of guns and gun handling um and crime associations yeah yeah, yeah we I mean, don't I'm, want I'm very much anti-gun in the house, very much anti-guns in the public domain. Mm. But um, when you're in a controlled environment, like a sport environment where, you know, the weapons come out for a particularly controlled way and they're, they're completely supervised and everything's very controlled, 
you know, that I think sometimes people have just taken advantage of the word gun without looking any deeper into it. Um, you know, I think there's definitely got, a bigger yeah. education piece around it. And, and that's one thing that I've really been trying to, to make a, a push towards is trying to show and demonstrate that actually shooting is an Olympic sport. It's got so many different benefits and there's something within shooting for everyone. So whether it's taking your kids out for a day and um, whether that's with an air rifle or a 410, um, you know, something small that they can kind of get their hands on and get involved with, or, you know, family days out, hen do's and stag do's are becoming ever more popular. Um, and so, although it is an Olympic sport, there is uh, a level and for everyone, all different ranges of ability, everyone can get involved. And that's why it's such a fantastic sport. So it's just getting into those places who've got no experience of shooting for what shooting is and what it actually is. Um, and, and explaining to them why it's so good and that actually guns aren't bad. You know, it's the the person in control of the gun that would potentially be the issue. However, with the licensing in the UK, you know, that's that's no longer an issue. Yeah, there's um, there's big cultural issues about the places in the world where guns are an issue, where you have mass killings on a regular basis. I mean, I live in the Czech Republic and um, every Czech person is allowed, if they wish, to buy, get a license and carry a, a weapon. Um, and then we have no gun crime here at all. So there's a, there's a cultural aspect behind it. But if you mix if you mix an idiot with the free access of weapons, then you've got a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think I've shot once in a what what we'd call a safe environment, and that was the range that I was talking about in the Navy. Um, second time was quite obscure we were in the i think we we're probably in the mediterranean or somewhere on this aircraft carrier and the pipe came over the tannoy to hear it to hear it if anyone would like to shoot clay pigeons go to the such and such boat deck well of course i think 12 marines immediately just stood up and went to the boat deck and one of the sailors had just brought his shotgun and he was massively into clay pigeon shooting and they'd set uh, the, the trap up. And um, yeah, we all had to go at popping a few clays out over the ocean. And the second time was my mate called me up and said, do you want to come shoot shooting? I said, yeah. So we went to his cousin's farm and he just handed me a shotgun. <laughs> and we just, we walked around the farm looking for, for rabbits and the like. And finally a, a pigeon flew over and I, up <laughs> one one feather feather <laughs> came down that was the i must have got reasonably clo close to it unless pigeons shed feathers when they're scared <laughs> <laughs> um, yes i tell you what we should do folks is let's go into the questions um because otherwise, I think we're 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 going to be recovering them if that makes makes sense. Or you're going to ruin all my the hours and hours I've spent preparing. <laughs> plan, Baldrick, will go wrong. <laughs> yes, all the best laid plans. So, first question, um, Georgie, uh, if you want to take this one first, what kind of mind and body warm up would you do in preparation for your for your shoot? Um, so that's, that's a really good question. I've just done a, a bit of a piece on this um, through my coaching. So for a, a mind warm up, it's very much um, listening to music, going through my process, which is kind of very OCD laid out, following different steps. So it's kind of like a, a checklist, making sure that everything's ready before you go on to the, to the round. Um, so yeah, listening to music, making sure that I'm putting my vest on it in the right order and things like that. Um, and getting to the range and whilst you're on the range uh, there's loads of different things that you can do so one of my favorites is watching the targets of the squad that's in front of me to warm my eyes up get used to what the the background looks like looking at the angles of the targets which are the bigger angles on which are the stands so I can prepare myself for that um, and also orange tennis balls are fantastic for again activating that hand-eye coordination like your I don't know receptors in your eyes or something just fires them up a little bit more um and again just warms your reactions up your um vision up so 
because you have to react to the target so quickly. You need to be able to make sure that your eyes are going to be able to adjust to the different depth perceptions. Um, see, that's another fantastic one, just as you're standing there getting ready. Um, and for the physical side of things, I've also got some resistance bands. So I've worked with a physio to um, come up with different warm-ups I can do for my upper body um, to activate muscles rather than to sap the energy away from them before I go on. Um, so one of the things I've learned recently that I didn't know was actually that using static um, warm-up drills uh, just like this actually sap energy for, from you before you go and do your physical exercise or your shooting or whatever that might be um, and just to again do little like movements that are going to warm up the muscles that you're the specific muscles that you're going to use um, so there's we've I've just recently done a couple of videos of the different warm-ups of the different resistance bands and how to go through them um, and I've sent them to my athletes that I'm, I'm coaching at the moment so they can use those as well. But it's really interesting to, when you start working with um, kind of people in high performance, that there's so much untapped knowledge that I just never knew about before I got into the world-class programme. So, yeah, it's really fascinating to know the different things that you can, you can do to warm up. Um, and, and then the last kind of more technical thing that I could do when I'm on the range is just a bit of dry mounting. Um, so if I was training um, just by myself, I could, you know, do a bit of single barrel training just to warm myself up. Um, but when you're about to shoot a competition, you can't just have a go at a few shots before, you know, they, they say ready. Um, so it's just getting on the stand and mounting the gun up into your shoulder and doing a few movements to make sure that you know that you're, you're mobile, you're ready and just making sure that the gun's sitting in the right place in your shoulder that all your layers are right and your vest isn't all crumpled up and things like that um, mm. and just making sure that you're ready to go i'd be um i think i'll be listening to some abba are you, are you gonna are you gonna let us in on what you'd listen to it depends what mood i'm in so um recently i've been listening to a little bit of arctic monkeys um but before that i've i've listened to queen so I'm, a, I'm a diehard queen fan um, yeah, it really just, it depends if I'm already in a hyped up mood, I'm ready to go. And if I need a little bit of motivation and, and a little bit of a kick up the bum to get myself psyched up for it. So yeah, it really depends. Robin, what would you be listening to? I, I, I picture you a bit like myself, an Avril Lavigne fan. Well, if it came to um, a stalk and a shoot, then the first thing you'd, very, very different scenario altogether. Because the um, first thing you'd be doing is looking at your map. Um, looking at the relief of the land, looking for the cover, looking for where you can be seen, where you can't be seen, looking at your air photography, uh, making your plan and your route, uh, then making sure your weapon's completely clean and ready and your ammunition's good and um, your camouflage is fantastic and you can't be seen. And then uh, knowing which areas you can walk through and which areas you need to crawl through uh, in order to get within range of um, your enemy or your target and then to be able to get in there to be absolutely unseen you have to make sure that your barrel is completely clean of oil so it doesn't leave any smoke um, because that's going to give you away um, it's no good just to get into a position take a shot and then be seen and then having somebody bring mortifier down on you so you um you need to be able to get in there fire a shot uh one shot take out your target and then be able to withdraw into the dead ground and move away and nobody ever knows you were there. Um, good, a good team of snipers can stop a battalion advancing because their fire is effective. So you start to take out specific people for specific reasons, leaders, um, people carrying heavy weapons and so on. Um, and you're also passing information back. So you're not always in a position of shooting. You have to maybe let people walk past you and pass the information about them back to uh, headquarters. Um, sometimes you bring down uh, gunfire on them as well. So it's um, it's a very different scene. It's a very different preparation. As far as music is concerned, you know, um, maybe a bit of Wagner in the background, da -da 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 -da, you know, <laughs> but no, absolute silence. It's immediately you pick up a very different vibe between the two environments, don't you? Yeah. yeah I mean, sport. Sport is wonderful and sport's important. It's great and it's good for everybody. Um, you know, taking, taking a military environment and 
trying to compare the two is 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 very very difficult. Mm. But the skills, the shooting skills um, of a person with a rifle. If Georgina was um, involved in rifle shooting, then the skills would be absolutely identical in terms of the marksmanship. Mm. But um, the skills that she has with a shotgun uh, are just not just not on my um, on my palate at all. I'm afraid. I'm just going to dive in there for our friends at home. Um, this is just a bit of fun, folks. This isn't a competition or we're not trying to say, you know, an SAS sniper is better than a, a British um, mar marks, marks person. Right? It, it's, it, 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 I'm fascinated with this conversation. So before you key war warriors go, oh, well, this is bloody da 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 da, it's, it's, you know, I, I hope people at home are enjoying this as much, much as I am. Um, well, yeah, the amazing thing about um, weapons is when I was um, when I was bodyguarding, I was a bodyguard to the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Rafi Kariri, and we used to live in Paris. And um, underneath Avenue Foch, there was a, a shooting range for hand handguns. And um, all my we all my weapons training with pistols had been with um, a nine millimeter automatic weapon. And um, when we got to Paris, we had to have a port d'arm, which allowed us to carry revolvers, but not automatics. So um, I couldn't hit a damn thing with the revolver until a, a man called Andretti, who was shoulder Gould's bodyguard at one time, took me aside and taught me the different uh, finger pressure technique with a revolver, because the first pull on the trigger has to rotate the drum, whereas that doesn't happen on an automatic. And um, or with that, with maybe I was about an hour's training with this guy privately, all of a sudden my shooting standards were up the level again. So, you know, I'm sure if I had an hour with Georgina, she'd get me to hit at least two out of 125, you know. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Next question then. Uh, so back to Georgie. Um, in your case, I'm going to say gun and ammo preparation. And then when we go to Robin, I'm going to say rifle and ammo preparation um so yeah how would you prepare your weapon I, it, is, is it right to call it a weapon in your that sounds a bit aggressive doesn't it I, well they are technically all weapons i guess um but a, a shotgun gun yeah yes so how would you prepare your shotgun and and your ammunition um so again like robin said just making sure that's all clean there's no uh, like blockages in the barrel um take it all together so it's just we have like lockable hard cases so the fore end and the barrel are separate to the you know, stop in the action so you just slot the barrels onto the action um, and then slide the fore end on um, and just break the gun so slide the top lever across make sure that um you, there's no ammunition already in the gun um and then you just got to make sure that you've got enough ammunition to take on for each round so um with trap shooting gets 25 targets but you're allowed two shots at each target um so you're allowed to take 50 shells or 52 because you're allowed to clear your gun first so when you go on your first round of the day you're allowed two shots just to make sure that the gun's in working order um and there's no damage or anything to the gun everything's fine and then you're allowed two shots at the rest of the round so in total you could potentially take 50 shots at each target so just making sure that you've got enough ammunition to see you through the round but it's all um you know for from the ground um so i know that I, and i don't know if you do robin but i know that with rifles you could a lot of people do some reloading um but that's not something you'd ever really be able to do with shotgun cartridges so everything's just shot bought and is there a, a an expiry date on these cartridges is that something that that is an issue in the sport not especially not the rate I go through my cartridges um, no there's not really um, so again you wouldn't leave cartridges lying around for 40 or so years and expect them to perform mm. as well as um, a new batch would however as long as they're kept in a you know a dry environment then you know they should be absolutely fine and which part of the shotgun would you be cleaning I I, I picture that you've got the long brushes right for the for the barrel is that I think we've all seen those what about the other parts of the so it depends so um if you're having like a really a bit of a spring clean then you would take it completely to pieces so um you take the trigger out and you'd 
maybe use a compressor and spray all the, the dirt and muck out of all the, the levers and the coil springs and whatever you've got going on in your trigger system. Um, however, that would potentially be once or twice a year um, or if you're getting your gun serviced. Um, but the rest of it, so you take, I've got a fixed choke barrel, um, but for those who don't, they take their chokes out of the end of the barrel and clean them, oil them, put them back in. Again, just clean the, the, um, the barrel and you spray the outside. So again, if it, if it was raining, you know, they go rusty, which has happened before. Um, and so I do the wood as well. So for the stock that I've got at the moment isn't quite finished yet. So I'm still every now and then shaving a little bit off here and there around the palm swell, just to make sure that it's, it's sitting nicely in my hand and I'm really comfortable with it. Um, How do you shave it off? It sounds like a bit of sandpaper or something. Paper. Yeah, because it's only like not even half a mil at a time. It's just making sure that it's just the, the tiniest bit. If it's a bit rough, I'll just sand it down a little bit more. Um, and then when, I, when I'm 100% happy with it, I just need a bit of you know wet to dry sandpaper, raise the grain, take the grain off, um, and then oil it, oil it down, which I haven't done yet, but I need to. Fascinating. I should point out uh, again for friends at home, the reason I keep making the di uh, the distinguishment, if that's even a word, between a rifle and a gun, is if I was to call a rifle a gun, my Marine, former Marine colleagues would crucify me. <laughs> it's a it's a golden rule in the Royal Marines. You never call a rifle a gun. And you certainly don't do what the army do is call it a gat, which is even a, a bigger sin for us as well. So yeah, I'm not I'm not trying to sound picky. Um, I'm just trying not to trip over my term terminology here. <laughs> so Robin, um, rifle and ammunition preparation and uh, this gets a bit more serious i suppose because it's life and well no, no not more serious winning a gold medal at the olympics is probably the most serious moment in your life uh but what robin's done is equally has e <laughs> it's equally serious implications but if you um as i say you know you, you take um the most difficult case which is you got you're going out alone on a stalk Sometimes you go in pairs of snipers, but um, you're going out alone on a stalk. Um, your weapon is your life, um, so and it can it can it can betray you as well as help you. So you need to make sure that your weapon can't do that. So you'll strip clean and assemble it. You'll make sure that it has almost no oil in it once you once you've uh, cleaned it, because smoke from that oil will give you away. You zero the weapon, which means you take it to a, a range if you have the opportunity, and you make sure that the the weapon is the weapon is firing exactly where the sights are pointing. Um, you make sure that your scope is good. You make sure that your lenses are clean. You make sure that your camouflage is not obscuring your lenses. You make sure that your camouflage is obscuring the tip of your barrel because that can be visible to somebody with binoculars at a distance. Um, you make sure your ammunition, the, the, the one thing people don't understand about um, rifles is that the accuracy depends as much on the ammunition as it does on the firer. Mm. If you have factory made ammunition in a 7.62 caliber, then at 100 meters, the chances are you'll get the best you're gonna get is a three to four inch group. And that's not down to the uh, 100 meters. And that's not down to the firer. That's down to the ammunition, the quality of the ammunition. Whereas if you get match-filled ammunition, which is measured to the absolute minimum grain and um, uh, handmade, then the same firer can probably get a one to two inch gap, two inch um, group at 100 meters. Now, when you take a target back to 800 meters to 1,000 meters, that's a huge difference. Even on a still day, that one inch difference of, of a group is going to be eight inches at 800 meters. Mm -hmm. And then you add the wind into it and you add the change of light. And the change of light can create a difference as well for where your shot falls and the angle that you're shooting at, whether you're shooting down the slope or up a slope, um, they make a difference to your perspective. So they make a difference to where the, the uh, shot falls. Um, so all these things have to come into consideration and you get one shot. <laughs> um, so um, it's, 
um, in, in our test with the Royal Marines, um, you got one shot and then a man came and stood behind you within five meters and the observers who were out to your front had to see if they could see you through binoculars. If they couldn't, you'd pass that bit. Then the man would come and put his hand on your head or on the tip of the barrel. And if they then couldn't see you, you'd pass. <laughs> mm. You know, so um, you know, being invisible was, was extremely important. Your camouflage has to be very, very good. They would also look through your sights to make sure you could see the target because clearly on a, a day when there are observers out in front, you were firing blanks. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount. I, I really get um, annoyed with the press when they refer to people on roofs and people in various conflicts as snipers. They're not, they're just firing, they're, sm they're, sm they're just gunmen, they're shooting. Um, a sniper is a man with a huge number of skills um, designed to make him a military weapon. Um, and it takes a long time. A, a marksman is a different thing. A marksman is one skill to being a sniper. And a marksman is somebody who can hit a target at a long range um, very, very effectively. That's a marksman. Mm. Um, and the terms are misused. When, you, when you're in the Royal Marines and you do the PW3, the sniper course, um, if, you, if you get 65% out of everything on the course, then you're, quite, you're classed as a sniper. If you get 80% on everything on the course, that's every single aspect, then you're a sniper marksman. And if you fail on any category by a quarter of a point, then you fail the whole course. And that's how serious it is. Uh, the Royal Marines formed the best sniper groups in the First World War. And they're the only unit in the, in the world to have maintained a sniper training system uh, since then. So for over a hundred years, and it shows in the quality of their the quality of their training and their people. Nobody comes close to it. You just reminded me of something then. When I was in training at Limpston and we had to do the stalks, so I guess we were what marks marksman training to be marksman on a stalk. So not not a sniper, but very similar to what Robin's talking about. We have to crawl into position. The guy comes and touches you he points like this and they have to say yay or nay and um as soon as they you, you're all lined out and the enemy is over there and you have to get as close to them as possible and they say go everyone just drops to ground or uh, that's what everyone was doing in my troop and I, <laughs> I would just head into the dead ground and run as fast as i could cover the quarter of a mile fo just follow all the dead ground basically and just get as absolutely as close as I, I could before I went to went to ground just to just to make the whole thing easier. Um, so yeah, so all the potential Royal Marine recruits watching, there you go. There's a good tip for you. If you go back to what Georgina was saying, it's something that we probably do have in common, that she was nodding, and that's quality of ammunition. Yeah. And you have to have your ammunition made specially for you because you know you're going to get the same uh, effect every single time you pull yeah. the trigger. Yes, yeah, some of the war zones you've been in, Robin, and, and some of the conflicts, I guess there's a big difference between, say, maybe Swedish or French made ammunition and, and Indian, no, not, Indian, for example. No, it's not so much that. It's just that um, if it's factory made, it's, um, you know, it comes off a machine, uh, they pump it out, and, um, and, you know, it's a standard. For everybody, you go down the you go down the local um, shooting shop and you buy 12, 12 gauge cartridges, and you know they're just made in the factory. When you get match filled ammunition, when you get handmade ammunition, then the differences are minimal, minimised to absolute nth degree, so that you're going to guarantee getting almost exactly the same effect with every single shot you fire. Incredible. So you so. The British military would actually factor that in. If you're if you're sent off to war, they're going to have snipers ammunition specially for you. Not really. They used to have a thing called Blackmore, which was selected ammunition from the factory batches. So it was the best factory batches. Um, when I was with Special Forces, we used to buy Winchester Match. Um, and when I was on the counter-terrorist team, it was Winchester Match. So that we had this high quality ammunition Um you know, because we were we had the budget and we were capable of doing it. I mean, most soldiers in conflict don't even look at what they're shooting at. <laughs> they just pull the trigger and hope for the best. 
um, you know, the, the very, very best trained and the, the old vets and so on, you know, they'll, they'll take their time, they'll breathe, they'll choose the target. But if you've got uh, 50 men shooting at an enemy across a field, there's probably only 10 on each side that are actually aiming. Yes, of course. Georgie, have you ever, or, or do you make your own ammunition? No, um, so you wouldn't be able to get as consistent if you were reloading shotgun cartridges. However, there's a big difference in the different manufacturers. So the best um, kind of quality ammunition you'd get really is from Italy. Um, you know, it's their, their bread and butter. Um, and it's kind of, especially with Olympic trap, you need kind of a quicker foot per second. So Olympic trap targets are shooting um, or they're flying out and they're traveling 76 meters. So you want to make sure that your ammunition is, you know, going to, your pellets are going to get there before it starts to drop off and, and hit the ground. So, yeah, there, there's a big difference, but we, we'd never relayed our own cartridges. Do you get sponsored for, for your training and stuff? Do you, I mean, do you get any kind of sponsorship? Are you allowed that? Uh, yes, you are allowed that. I'm really fortunate that I'm sponsored by um, Shooting Star, who are the importer for RC cartridges. Um, so I get my cartridges. Um, sponsored thankfully but sponsorship is so few and far between in the UK it's really really difficult to get um, and I'm one of very very few who have got a cartridge sponsor so yeah there are there are a lot of people out there who haven't and shooting star if you're watching yes thank you just very giving much. you a shout out on the bought the t-shirt podcast that's a tenner please <laughs> um what are we on next I've I've got um Pressure, as in dealing with the pressure of the situation, posture, and squeezing the trigger. What can what can we say about that, Georgie? I can say something for everything. So I, I, I have shot. Um, I'm all right with a rifle. I've obviously done a lot more shotgun than I have rifle, and um, but there's a huge difference in squeezing the trigger. So with shotgun, it's much more of a um, clunky movement. So it's just give it a good old jank. Um, rather than a gentle squeeze that you would do, um, you know, for a rifle. Um, so yeah, that the first time I shot a rifle, that was a bit of a surprise for me because um, no one told me that. Um, so mindset and, and dealing with pressure is just the more, you, you know, the more you, ex, you know, expose yourself to competition, the, the easier it is to cope with. And, and once you've been on the world stage competing in, World Cups, you know, the pressure's always there as long as you care. So you always want to feel some kind of pressure and some kind of nervousness, because if, if you lose that, then you know it doesn't matter anymore. And that's probably when you should stop competing because yeah. you it, it needs to matter to you. Do, do you have a specific technique to say, block out the crowd or block out the magnitude of, of, of the event that you're involved in and just try to be yourself? Is there anything you, you, you say to yourself or? Yeah, there's lots of things that I say to myself. So there's a few different things. Um, so I've got like a mental routine as I'm shooting. So um, it would be just to remind myself to, uh, like of my process is probably one of the main things. So if, I, if I'm keeping my head down, um, say there's the TV cameras or whatever floating around, keeping my head down. Um, when I'm in between stands and when I'm on the stands, my eyes are out on my pickup point for where I'm going to pick the target up and just focusing on, on there. And I'll use like positive phrases to kind of big myself up and give myself almost affirmations as to, you know, you deserve to be here. You're going to smash that target and using visualization. So in a final, we use flash targets. So you shoot the target and there's a, it's got powder underneath the target. So when you shoot it, it explodes the big pink puff of smoke. Um, and so I just visualize that for in between every single target. And it, you just break it down into, it's not a competition of 125 targets plus a final. It's 125 miniature competitions of one target. I just have to shoot this one target. Okay, I've hit that one, fantastic, right? Forget that one. I've got just got to shoot this next target. Fantastic, I've hit that one. And even if you miss one, it's the same thing. Doesn't matter, you've missed one, On to the next one. Next competition of one target. Fantastic, I've hit that one. And then having a mindset like that is, is rather than build it, trying to build a score in your head, you're like 
I don't know how to explain it. You're just cheating on focusing on that one simple task rather than having this huge job in front of you and breaking it down into tiny little steps instead of having a huge set of ladders in front of you is just so much easier to cope with mentally. Mm. Um, but when I'm shooting, yeah, I'll tell myself all these different positive things and I'll calm myself down. And I use um, acceptance therapy, um, acceptance and conversion therapy, I think it's called. So it's just accepting what's happening. If you have, like, you're never going to be able to get rid of your negative thoughts that you can try, but your brain can only focus on one thing. So if you're trying so hard to get rid of that one negative thing, you're just focusing on it more and giving it more attention. So actually just saying, okay, I've got this negative thought. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't get rid of it. Just accept that it's there and park it for now. And I can deal with it later. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, so just leave it in a box and then shoot that target. And then you can think about it in between you know, the next target. Um, and then as soon as you, you're ready for your task, you're going to shoot that target. Okay, you can stay there. It doesn't matter. Just focus on the process and keep going like that. And, and one thing that I found really, really helpful is actually almost going into like a meditative state. So mm -hmm. just being solely focused on that one thing and just being really like almost in a trance because it's such a repetitive sport. You know, you've got to love repetition to, to shoot Olympic trap or Olympic ski. Um, but it's, it really makes you focus and it doesn't matter what's going on around you. No one's going to pull you from that. And it's just, it's one thing that I'm working on at the moment is how to pull myself in and out of that like trance um, when I need to. So if someone on the range um, comes and gives you a yellow card or something like that, you have to break yourself out of it. Um, if, or if there's a trap breakdown, you're waiting for 10 minutes before you can continue to shoot. It's um, okay, I, I need to come out of this now, go back on stance, okay, back to work, back into that state of mind. And, and that's one thing I'm really, really working on. And it's, it's, it's hard work, but when it works and you get it right, you're unstoppable. Hey, there's got to be a great book there, hasn't there? Zen and the Art of Shotgun yeah. Shooting. That fits, in, that fits in perfectly. Um, it is a Zen experience you're talking about. Yeah. I did martial arts for more than 30 years until I broke my neck. And um, But um, one of the things I would add is that you must train under pressure, you must train with fear. Yeah. Now, that's just not the fear of being killed, that's the fear of failure, the fear of missing, the fear of making a fool of yourself, all those fears. And um, so you must train with that pressure all the time. And there's a, a famous writer and a psychologist called Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote Tipping Point and Blink, and uh, what the dog saw. And, uh, you know, he essentially said that a lot of people uh, make mistakes uh, with firearms because they um, they're placed in a, a situation they're not used to. So a policeman with a gun who suddenly gets confronted by something, he's not very fit, um, his heartbeat shoots up. You can't make minor cognitive decisions uh, when your heartbeat goes above 145 beats a minute. Mm. So if the fear gets to you in any capacity, then you can't function properly, uh, which is why special forces soldiers, why athletes, um, you know, uh, of your with, with with specific skills, have to train with pressure. And the other thing is, don't let the little voice come into your head. Have you ever been rehearsing something or practicing something, and a little voice comes into your head? Is what about? And you know, you get distracted. You must learn to keep the little voice out of your head, which is then. Um, once you get the little voice out of your head, you're operating with a part of your brain that's natural, and all you need to remember is the first thing you ever do in every system. So if the first thing you ever do is put your feet in a particular position, so long as you remember to put your feet in that particular position, everything else will follow through, providing you don't let the little voice come into your head. Mm -hmm. Robin, was that, um, obviously that must have been a factor in the Iranian embassy siege because the policeman who was held hostage had a pistol, didn't he? Yeah, so Trevor Locke had a uh, 38 Smith & Wesson, um, not Smith & Wesson, Walther, I think it was. Um, anyway, he had, a, he had a 38 revolver that he never drew and used because he knew that it would have made the situation worse. But he held on to it right until the very last moment when we assaulted the building. Um, but again, he was thrust into a situation that he wasn't prepared and trained for. Um, he was a policeman with a gun. And all of a sudden, this disaster happened where 
he suddenly held hostage with 23 other people um, in a building for six days. And he's got this gun tucked down his jacket all the time. Um, and he has the discipline not to use it because he realized that it could only make things worse. Um, he he um, struggled with that decision later because one of the hostages was murdered um, by one of the terrorists and uh, he didn't do anything about it and he always struggled with that. But I reassured him when I met him that it was the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, Zen is, um, is, is getting into that automatic um, system of functioning where all your training and all your um, input and everything else comes together in a moment and it, all the noise seems to disappear. You're in a kind of, um, you're in a kind of container where even if there's a crowd, they're at a distance, they're outside, the noise is coming from a far, far away. And um, for that short moment when you're practicing your skill, you're contained in this very, very special uh, environment where everything seems to be slow motion. And yet it's not, it's an absolute full speed, absolutely uh, focused on that one thing that you have to do and complete in that short period of time. And if you can hold on to it, it's amazing what you can do, but it takes, it's not, it's not just something in the brain, it's, it's years and years and hours and hours of constant repetition, work, practice and instruction and listening and absorbing what other people can give you and finally putting it together. And uh, in, in that moment, you know, you, you very rarely forget the moments when that happens to you. Wow. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> what have I got here next? So, um, Georgie, how does atmospherics and weather affect what you do? Quite a lot. Um, so again, being on a shooting range, we're outside, we're kind of exposed to the elements. So um, quite often in the UK, we've got a bit of a shelter. So we've got um, a kind of a roof over the layout, but there won't be a, like a back or any sides to it. It's just to kind of get the rain off us. Um, but any extreme weather conditions, so wind has a massive, massive um, impact on targets, um, making them skip, dive, up, bring them back over the top of us. Um, so I can't remember what the storm was called, but we had a, a very windy storm a couple of weeks ago when we were on a GB training camp. And um, some of the targets, um, the left-handed targets were shooting out and then coming back over the top of us like this. Um, and because, you know, in those situations, it was only a training camp, so we, we were able to have a bit of fun with it. Um, we would, instead of, when we saw it, it was the left-hander coming out, instead of shooting at them, um, we would wait and we would shoot them sporting style. So we would wait for them to come back over the top of us and then shoot them um, as they reached their peak and were on the way down just to have a little bit of fun with it. Um, so yeah, I think with Olympic trap and severe weather, um, you do need to have other skills. So it, it definitely benefits you if you have a little bit of experience of shooting skeet or shooting sporting. So they're, you know, crossing targets like you, you talked about earlier, Robin, the ones that you do have to give lead for. Um, and just being able to use your shotgun at anything you put it to um, and just knowing that the gun fits you properly. So wherever you point it, it's, you know, mm. it's going to break the target um, and knowing that that fits you well, it, as, as long as you put that near well, the sight is, or the end of the barrel on the target, you know, it's going to break is definitely going to help. Yeah, I remember um, in my military training, if there was, say, a wind gusting mildly you would aim off the the figure 11 target comes with a set of rings around if i remember mm -hmm. rightly and you would just aim for the so if the wind's coming from in from the left you would aim to your left one one ring so maybe a, a hand whip a hand whip from from the center if it was a sort of moderate to strong wind you'd aim at the edge of the target and obviously, the, the greater the distance, the more you increase this aiming off. But with the SA-80, if you were firing at, say, 300 metres in a, in, in a strong wind, you'd be aiming off sort of several, several target whips. It was almost like a sort of guess, guessing 
educated um, guessing game. Is that the same when when you're shooting? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't have any kind of marker points to go, okay, well, I need to be this many rings over. Um, it's just, you kind of just have to read the target. It's just going off natural instinct. And again, it's just having that experience in other areas of shotgun discipline that's going to help with that. And just reading the target, how much your target's dropping. And then again, like you say, an educated guess as to how much you need to be in front or underneath or over the top of it, um, depending on where the wind's taking it. Wow. Incredible. Yes. Uh, same question to you then, Robin. What atmospherics and weather? It seems when you watch these films like American Sniper and he's got his wingman there and they're adjusting and it... Um, yeah, I mean, all, all, all those things that like that are relevant. Um, the, the greater the range, the more the relevance. So um, if you're shooting at somebody 100 metres away, um, then the atmospherics are not going to make a big enough uh, difference for you to be too concerned about it unless somebody's running or walking across your front and you have to lead them. But if they're standing still, uh, or in a fixed position, then you're going to, it's not going to make a difference. When you get back to ranges over 600 metres, over 500 metres, then all the atmospherics actually come into play. The light, the level of light changes um, the fall of shot because it changes your visual perspective. Um, the te air temperature changes, the uh, air pressure changes it. If a cold, dry uh, weather, the air is thicker than warm, wet weather. So, you know, over a long range, that's going to make a difference to uh, the fall of your shot. On a cold, dry day, your shot's gonna fall lower at 1200 meters than it is on a, on a wet day, believe it or not. I mean, everyone imagines, that, oh, it's, it's wet, it's, it's thick, it's humid. Well, believe it or not, the, the air is thinner on a warm, wet day than it is on a cold, dry day. Um, and you learn this if you ever fly helicopters, <laughs> it's aerodynamics. Um, you know, so, all those things come into play. The wind uh, is, is vitally important. You have to be able to read the wind. And at a long range, the wind may be still where you are, but you have to look at the trees or the grass or the vegetation um, uh, across the whole distance that your, your shot is going to travel, because you may find that there's a gap in the trees where the wind comes through. And or look at the tops of the trees where it's swaying backwards and forwards, the grass on the ground is a good indicator of what the wind's doing all the way down to the target if there's grass. Um, the ripples on the top of the water will give you an indication. Um, all those things come into play if you're going to be able to hit somebody at a long, a long distance. Um, the closer it gets, the less important these things become, but they're all relevant. I'm going to disappear for 20 seconds, Chris, for a very important reason. I'll be back. Okay, okay I'm just going to... Uh, I will chat to Georgie then. Yeah. I guess you've got to go and punch a bear, Robin. So <laughs> give it one from me. I was going to talk about ranges, Georgie, but you've, I think you've already, I mean, you're kind are you, is your sport at a sort of fixed range? Or I, I guess, and they can set the trap at different powers for probably using the wrong, <laughs> wrong word, but. Yeah, they can. So, um, Within Olympic trap, if you are shooting an IWSF event or it's um, like a, a Great Britain selection shoot, they will always be set to kind of maximum output. So they're all going to be traveling the 76 meters um, because that's kind of like the international standard. Is, is um, that 76 meters a second? Um, no, just that's the, dif the distance that uh, the target will travel. Is um, that before it starts to dip or when it hits the ground? So that's from the trap to its um, kind of final destination, so hitting the ground. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up. Yeah, so it's, if you're coaching a beginner or getting someone new into the sport, you would then wind the trap back um, and you'd ease off the, prep, the power and the pressure kind of thing on the springs just so it's not as soul-destroying for someone who's just getting into it because you want to, hook them in you want them to enjoy it you want them to be able to hit some targets you don't want to like let them hit absolutely nothing the first time around they'll put them off for life um because it's soul destroying i think um, we're, all, we're all parents aren't we i think i know robin is 
Yeah, I, I'm not. No. All right. So uh, that I think that r rings a bell with all parents out there, <laughs> ma making it a bit easier. Yeah. Believe it or not, I'm a great grandfather. Three times. Hey. A great grandfather, yeah. You look way too old for that, Robin. I know, I know. And that's without a beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's what's the longest sort of shot you've taken then, Robin, and had a bit of success with? At twelve hundred meters. Okay. Twelve hundred meters on a man sized target. And um, you know, uh you get it, I got everything right on that particular day. And you know, you sit back and uh you say, okay. The most important shot any soldier ever takes is the first shot. And so you do all, all use all your skills and all your uh, readings and you hope you've got it right. And then you lay down and you, you know, you breathe out. I mean, the, the breathing system with, um, with a rifle is very, very important because the only time you're, if you're laying down, then you would be at 1200 meters. Um, your, your, the only way you're going to get exactly the same position with your chest is to have empty lungs. So you breathe out and then you squeeze, bang. If you breathe, if you have air in your lungs, it's gonna change your firing position on the ground. So the only way you're gonna get a consistent position is have empty lungs every time you, every time you shoot. So uh, you get everything absolutely right and bang, that first one goes. And at 1200 meters, if you've got a number two next to you uh, bringing you onto target, then he's got binoculars. So you can actually see the swirl of the shot as it affects the air going down the range, especially on a, on a hot day where you've got heat haze, you'll see the round fly down to the target and you'll know it went straight through the center of that target before um, anybody indicates at the other end that you did. Um, those are 1200 meter range this was rather than you know any, anything real. Um, in a war situation, you take shots. If you shoot at somebody from a great range in a war situation, if you hit them, they fall down. If you don't hit them, they get down. So you don't know the difference. <laughs> you just don't know the difference if somebody starts shooting. You back. do if they shoot back. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, but 1,200 meters is the uh, longest shot I ever got um, on the first on the first round. Yeah. One of the things that was unique when I went through training is the SA80 was fitted with a SUSAT sight, so an optic optical sight as opposed to iron sights on the SLR. Do we have any thoughts on those, George? Um, suet, suet, suet sights were invented in, uh, came into the British Army in 1973, I think, and were issued to the British Army in Northern Ireland in 74, 75. And um, they gave you a, a, an, an, an indication of a red dot on a target. They didn't place a red dot on a target, they gave you an indication of a red dot on a target. It was, um, it was, um, you had to have both eyes open. And um, it, so it was a, a an optical illusion. Mm. Um, but That's, uh, they, just, they weren't as good as iron sights. They weren't as good at iron sights. Just really. to clarify, the SE 80 was an actual telescopic sight, Su SUSAT, I believe it was oh. called, although it was a. Sorry, I got it mixed up. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. That's those, so the red dot things, that's. Did, did the um, Special Air Service use those kind of sites? No, it, it came into standard British Army use to Northern Ireland um, uh, in the hope that, you know, you're patrolling the streets at night, you haven't got good visual, visual sort of uh, theatre. Um, so um, they tried it for a while, but I never liked it. I'd much rather, I took it off and uh, just rather fire over iron sights. Yeah. Uh, much, much better. It's a bit Hollywood, um, isn't it, where the, the bad guy suddenly sees the red dot land there and you all know it's game over. Well, um, yeah, th those come from uh, night viewing goggles, essentially uh, night viewing aids. So um, usually you're wearing, uh, you're going into pitch blackness and you're wearing night viewing goggles. So, you know, your, 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 um, your goggles are putting out infrared light so that they can read it and so that you can see when the other person can't see. Um, so often those red dots that you see in movies come from the goggles rather than the weapon. Um, the idea that, you know, you're going to fire, a, you're going to have a laser on the end of your rifle. Well, that's a good idea and that can be done too. Um, but I'm not sure that it's actually going to, the laser is actually going to help you with your shot in many ways. Great with a tank. 
Yeah, I had Tony Hayes, um, former SBS, on the podcast, and he went out on a patrol in Afghanistan, and all his team were kitted up with a late, the, you know, the, these, what's the name? There's a name for them, I can't. Again, folks, put it in the comments. I My grey cells are not working, but um, uh, they all went out with their night night vision goggles. N NVGs, do they call them? I don't know. And um, his broke. <laughs> So everyone else can see in the dark except him. So I, so I said, Tony, did you get your torch out? <laughs> then everybody else wouldn't be able to see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the the thing about the um, SUSAT site is a great site. It's an optical site. It's just got a pointer in, in, in and it brings, I don't know, I, I, I'm not, I don't know the technolo the technological term, but it would sort of bring your target maybe four times closer but with the slr which obviously has an eye in sight it was just as it was more accurate than the se80 with the and i'm not one of these guys that slags this weapon off against this i'm just saying uh, over 300 meters you you just can hit a, the target every time with the slr it's a really well, i'll do it for you i'll do it for you the sa80 is the is the worst infantry weapon the British Army has ever had since the musket. It's a piece of garbage. Uh, the ammunition's low caliber. Um, so as you said, you know, it doesn't guarantee knocking a person down. It was, it was a convenience to um, manufacture a weapon that was British made, but with NATO standard ammunition. Which is, which is yeah, they wanted to keep it in-house British, didn't they? You could see that. It's I think we should point out, in all fairness, it's gone through several evolutions, and the final I, weapon I've heard people speak. I think the term terminology for that is polishing third. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think now it's all going to be be uh, be be replaced with. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot better weapons companies out there, aren't there? Some of these Swedish ones and and yeah. Swiss and. Um, Yes. Another thing about low caliber ammunition on 25 is cheaper than 7.62. So ultimately, it's some accountant somewhere made the decision about what the army should and shouldn't use. Cheaper and lighter, isn't it? It's lighter for you to carry. It's lighter for for the um, you know, logistics, I, I I suppose. And of course, the Americans use it, don't they, with their armor lights or their? Is that the armor light? Is that the right terminology? I can't. Yeah, AR15, yeah. AR15, yeah. Um, it, uh, but it's a longer weapon. AR if they just bought AR-15s, then they'd have been fine. You know, it would have done exactly the same job, but better. A self-cleaning self weapon that floats. I mean, you can't really go wrong for Marines, can you? I say uh, yeah. self-cleaning. That's what they used to say. Yeah, useful in useful in close close combat environments. Um, not great when you come to places like the Falklands or the desert, where the enemy's sitting back there at a long range, and you can't even get close to him because your weapons won't fire that far. Not good, but soldiers don't decide what the what the army uses. Accountants decide. Yes. Accountants. Pitching over. <laughs> yeah, and the accountants take their take their advice from the the clowns. <laughs> right. Let's. I think we should speed speed this up before before we um, bore people with gun stuff, but. Uh, Georgie, fa favorite weapon? What's what's your favorite thing that you you have shot or like to shoot? Um, so, shotgun. I've got a proxy SC3, um, which is my absolute baby. It's got ported barrels, uh, handmade stock. It's just perfect for me. What, um, what barrels? Um, they're ported, so they've had holes drilled into the end of them to help um, expel extra pressure and gas release the gas so I get less recoil and is that I, I, I should have asked you do you fire double barrel at all or is it always a, a single barrel um so it's a double barrel gun um and I take two shots um yeah. at one target until you're in the final which is just one one shot and do you still use the double barrel gun or would you swap to a single barrel then no, it's still the same gun. You just use one cartridge. Because I guess you're all in the in the zone then, aren't you? You, you wouldn't want to change weapons at that stage. You're not allowed. Not allowed. Okay. Mm. Yes. Bloody rules. I know. <laughs> um, Robin, any any particular? 
Well, I've got to go back to back a long way to 1984, actually, um, when I trialed a, a new weapon that was going to be introduced um, to the British Army as a sniper rifle. And uh, it was taken over from the L-42, which had lost, you know, it had, had lost, had had its day. And um, it was, it, the, the trial weapon was called a P-38. It was a 7.62, 36-inch um, free-floating steel chromium barrel. The pistol grip was fitted to my very, very small hands. And um, so it would size so I could use the second digit of my finger on the trigger. Uh, I had a bipod on the front. Um, and uh... oh, have we? Um, yeah, I think he's frozen. Yeah. One second. Oh, there we go, Robin. You froze them for a second. Yeah. Yeah. So the solid steel chromium barrel that um, the bipod on the front um, it had um, perfect uh, position for my for my elbow to. Um, uh, everything was fitted to me, and then match-filled uh, ammunition. And so um, we had these very small targets that the size of a human head called Hun heads. Um, and um, with a running man going across my front at 400 meters, I managed to hit nine targets out of 10. Um, that's, 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 that's pretty good. Um, now, yes, I was a bloody good shot then when my eyes worked. But um, also, it was the weapon and the ammunition as well. It was wonderful. But by the time they'd cheapened it down to something that was going to be soldier proof for the British Army, the weapon that actually came in in about 1986 um, didn't live up to those standards at all, sadly. My favourite, funny enough, well, no, I'd never really had a favourite. I did, probably didn't shoot enough to begin having favourites, but... I loved firing the um, the SMG. Was it Sterling submachine gun? You stuck the. I think you had a 30, uh, 30, rounds. 30, 30, 30 rounds, nine millimeter. Obviously, apparently it wouldn't go through a wet blanket. So, what wasn't necessarily the best weapon for for stopping an enemy, but. The thing I loved, and of course it was prone to stoppages because it was quite quite dated technology now. Um, but the thing I loved about that and also firing the GPMG, so the general purpose machine gun, was that you can, even though it's going off quite quickly, the GPMG much more so than the SMG, you could feel the mechanism in your, you, you could feel the and there was something about that that I don't know. It's obviously appealed to me uh, thirty years later. There's an incredible feeling of power when you're you've got a weapon that's going, you know, firing for four or five rounds a second, um, and uh, accurately at something that's six, eight hundred meters away. Mm. Uh, GPMG is fantastic. I um, the best um, machine gun for accuracy that I ever used was the uh, LMG, which was a conversion to seven point six two from the old Second World War Bren gun. Mm. And um, the problem with it was sometimes it didn't spread the rounds enough to be an effective machine gun. So you had to change, you had to actually move the weapon in order to get the coverage, but it was a very, very useful sniper weapon too. Mm. Very, very good weapon indeed. I carried one in Northern Ireland four months in South Armagh. Um, absolutely brilliant, um, brilliant piece of equipment. Yeah. Is it the one that has the magazine on top? That's right, yeah. How do you look around that, or am I being... Sights are at the side. The sights are at the side of the um, weapon. Yeah. So you touch down the side of the barrel rather than on top of it. And Georgie, we should ask you, is there such a thing as a stoppage in, in competition? Or, a, or it, it may be either a stoppage or a, or a shell that just is a dud? Yeah, um, you get dud cartridges every now and then. Thankfully, I, I've not really had many of them. Um, and you're allowed to have three, or you're allowed to have two per round. And if you get a third one, you lose the target. It's a yellow card. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it because nine times out of 10, especially if you're um, traveling around the world, you buy the cartridges from that range. But it, it, even though it's a manufacturer's fault and you still get the yellow card and get deducted a target. 
must be a tough sport to be a referee in because you everyone you're dealing with has got a shotgun in their hand <laughs> um um right let's let's bring this to a close with a one last question and um then i think georgia i'd like to ask you how people can get involved in the sport because i'm i'm a big um you know i i believe as an englishman we have the right to bear arms it's in our constitution i think it's in there for a reason and i i know a lot of americans feel feel the same so my last question is what are our thoughts on uk gun law it's a tricky one so i think i understand why um we have such strict laws because we are trying to kind of not contain the sport but make sure that um people who should have them can have them um, and if you do want them then you can have you can apply for a license um, I think some of the rules around the licenses are um, a bit too strict in, in some cases and they could be stricter in other instances so and I know that they differ as well from um, district to district or county to county mm -hmm. um, but I know that shotgun certificates are a lot easier to apply for and get hold of than firearm certificates and um, so we are quite fortunate in, in that respect. Yes. And so I guess we've got many different scenarios, haven't we? We've got people that are going to the range where it's very controlled, or at least you, you'd like to think so. Mm -hmm. You've got farmers who will have a shotgun because that's what farmers have always had for what, what they would call pest control. But don't I wouldn't say that to someone who loves the foxes. Um, and bloody hell, there is a lot of foxes in this country. My friend goes out. He's got a. He's got all. He's been shooting for years. He's got a, the gun case with all the very plush-looking weapons in it. And I mean, he'll shoot three foxes on a on a on a in in one night. <laughs> um, and the farmers kind of welcome it, obviously, especially in is it lambing season. Um, but then. Um, I guess it was, was it pistols that was banned in the UK? Yeah, so you're still allowed air pistols because um, we still have uh, teams for World Cups with air pistols, but um, any handguns, yeah, are banned. Yeah, and I'm guessing automatic weapons, are, are, are they're a no-no in this country, are they? No, so I think you are still allowed some automatic weapons, but I think they're not on a shotgun certificate. They would be classed as a firearm. Yeah, got you. Robin, any thoughts on that subject? No, I had some very strong thoughts on it, to be honest. Um, I remember when the children were murdered by the man with the pistol, the school children, the infants at school, were murdered in Scotland. I can't remember the name of the village. Dunblane. Uh, um, Dunblane, yeah. The, um, I had to stop my car when I heard it on the radio in shock at um, the evil of the whole situation. And the gun laws in Britain were tightened they were already fairly strong, but they were tightened even more. Um, I personally believe that where handguns are concerned, um, where shooting and sporting weapons are concerned, uh, they should be um, in a secure environment. And so if you're in a gun club and you want to go pistol shooting, it's in a secure armory um, in a gun club where you sign it out, you sign it back in before you leave. Um, and they shouldn't be in the home because everybody has a bad day and some people cope with their bad days differently. Um, I don't, I think that all semi-automatic weapons um, should be banned in the United Kingdom um, unless they get, again, they're in that sporting environment where, where farmers are concerned. Uh, yes, they should have single shot weapons like shotguns that they can use to control vermin. Where hunters are concerned, yes, they should have single shot weapons to do that. Um, there is nothing in Britain doesn't have a constitution, so you know we have no rights to bear arms in the United Kingdom. No, we, Robin, we do. Believe me, I, I, I've chatted with Graham Moore, who's an absolute expert on. Uh, it, we, I don't think it's, it's it's off the back of the Magna Carta. No, the Magna uh, Carta isn't law either. Um, so I would check that out. But that's a, that's probably another story. Um, you know, but if you if you combine the freedom free access to a weapon that can kill multiple people, then 
you allow somebody who's having one of those breakdowns to kill multiple people. Whereas if they don't have access to that, they'll, they'll get a knife and kill one or two. Um, a person with a shotgun, you know, can only pull the trigger twice. Um, a person with a handgun um, will be able to pull it six to 12 times. A person with an automatic weapon can kill a lot of people in a very short space of time before he's stopped. You know, so the idea that, you know, there's some kind of um, personal right that gives me on any, per on any day um, the right to walk around the streets and uh, if I'm fed up with the world and decided I'm going to end it to take as many people with me, um, is morally wrong. Um, you know, so um, guns should be uh, available in a sporting environment, in a hunting environment, um, but they shouldn't be available for everybody. Um, there should be stringent tests. You have stringent tests to drive your car, which is also a lethal weapon. You know, you have background checks. You, have, you make sure that there's no history of um, mental instability. And uh, then they have to be secure um, all the time, which they do if you have weapons at home anyway. Um, you know, in, in the United States of America, um, more children are killed every year by accidents fiddling around with their father's weapons than in any other, any other environment. More people are killed by accidents than they are in prevention of crime. And um, they had, last year, 2020 in the United States, they had 611 multiple killings with guns in the United States of America, you know? So it's crazy to think that, you know, somebody can write into law the fact that you can walk around and have the right to kill anybody you want, whenever you want, if you're having a bad day. Um, you know, there's, there's a balance and the balance is wrong. But if you've been brought up in Rambo and, um, you know, Dirty Harry, and you think that, um, all the world's problems can be cured by a greater level of force. And if you kill the bad guy, order is restored, then you're wrong. It doesn't work that way. It makes things worse. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very well aware there's a, um, a lot of other implications in the subject. I think my, a lot of my audience will know what I'm referring to. I'm just not going to go there for this podcast. <laughs> because i'm i'm sick of doing the controversial stuff and everyone will have a different opinion but friends at home put your thoughts in the comments um just be respectful if you want your comment to say that is there's no need to be um there's no need to be rude just put your point across um because i think i think other people will probably find it fascinating so georgie if we can finish up with you um, how can people get involved in this wonderful sport? So there's loads of different ways, thankfully. So you can go through British Shooting. If you head to the British Shooting website, um, you'll be able to get in contact with coaches and or athletes um, or British Shooting themselves to find out more about the sport. So I host a number of talent identification days for British Shooting so it, or open days. Um, so you can come and try the Olympic disciplines and then kind of get your foot on the ladder of the talent pathway. So it's the, the bottom kind of runs of how to get to the world class programme, which is where I am, and then onto the Olympics. And um, so we do have that infrastructure in place already for all the way through from grassroots to full time athlete professional level sport, which is fantastic. Um, you can also get in touch uh, with the Clay Pigeon Shooting Association or any of the home nations. Um, who have a list of their registered grounds. So you can type in your postcode and find out where your local gun club will be um, and you can get involved, either contact them directly or again, you can contact the DPSA um, and they will point you in the right direction. From, from what age can people join these organisations or, or go to a range? Um, so you can go at whatever age. I, I would kind of say to fire a 410, which is kind of the smallest gauge, um, you'd probably be looking at anywhere up from 12 years old, which is kind of where we allow people to join the pathway. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there are most of the grounds that I've been to have air rifle ranges. So if parents are having a go at um, clay pigeon shooting, then the youngsters who are under the age of 12 and are comfortable to do so can have a, like a little bit of a ping with an air rifle just to get kind of involved in the sport in some way. And then when they do get to that age, when they are, um, 
you know, able to hold the shotgun for themselves and pull the trigger without being too affected by the recoil. Um, because if you're if you're younger than 12, but you are quite, you know, you're of substantial size and you can hold that, that weight of that shotgun, then there's nothing to stop you getting involved earlier than that. Um, so yeah, from, from 12 years up and, you know, there are people who are still representing uh, the home nations who are in their 80s. So, you know, we, there's a lot of longevity with the age and ability, um, which is fantastic. What would we say to people that say, Georgie, I, I, I've always wanted to shoot a gun or a rifle, um, but I'm a bit scared. It kind of goes bang. And um, what, 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 what could we say there? Um, so there's loads of different things that we can do to prevent you being put off or scared by um, the recoil and, and the bang. So it's making sure that you're protected. So head protection, eye protection, ear protection, making sure that um, if you are really put off by it, we can give you a recoil pad, um, which is a, a gel pad, which will sit on your shoulder, which is going to absorb some of the recoil. So it's a preventative measure. It's not going to stop the recoil. And they, um, they issue them to the... Can they issue them to the parachute regiment? <laughs> I'm sure I, that I could have got one. I would have had one. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, I, I genuinely feel I've been joined by a couple of legends today. I um, and so that makes three of us. Look, I've got, <laughs> I've got a mug. It must be true. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, Hope to have more of them in the future. Um, Georgie Paris 2024, mm -hmm. we'll all be rooting for you. Thank you very much. I know you will bring home the gold, no pressure, but I just know that you will. <laughs> and for any, uh, would it help if we put a shout out for sponsorship? Does that help you in any way? Or, or how, how can people get in touch to pr promote what you're doing and support you? Um, so probably through email or social media. So you can email me at georgina at gtroberts.co.uk or you can get involved in my social media accounts. So it's at Georgina Tamsin Roberts on Instagram, at Georgina Shoots on Twitter and Georgina Roberts Shooting on Facebook. Brilliant. I'll put those in. If you can just email me those links in a nice little paragraph so I can put below our, our video. Or do you have a Patreon? A what, sorry? A Patreon platform. Uh, no, I don't. No, you should think about that. Um, I'm sure there'll be many people in this fine nation who want to support your efforts. And I've, I have a Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Chris Thrall, folks. And I, 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 I have the most amazing people because I don't really earn much money, believe it or not, doing what I do. Um, a lot of people recognise that, but, but they they still want you to keep doing it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for example, someone very kindly bought me two Shure microphones. It was 800 pounds. Mm. Um, I have one of my um, Patreons very kindly. I won't say the name for privacy reasons, but, but just paid a year's subscription up. You can put different levels. So if people want to pay 199 a month, they can. If they want to pay um, 9.99, they can. If there, are, if if money's not an issue for them, some people will come in at 49 pounds a month, 100 pounds a month. Um, my one of my kind sponsors just came in with a thousand pounds, like like that, and it really means it means I can keep doing what I'm doing. Um, but for what you're doing, representing the nation, I'm sure I'm sure they'd probably be many people out there that would they just want a part of it you know yeah. they, they, what you can do on each level you can offer different um let's call them benefits so maybe if someone comes in um at the 100 pounds a month level you can have a zoom chat with them every you know every month or something or or or, or, or you can do a special shooting video and obviously there's a big shooting population in this um in the uk as it is that would that would just be keen to you can give your tips through there um this kind of stuff you could do gun reviews what you know what, what whatever it might be in i'm i'm all, all my sponsors 
for 199 a month get to come to my annual talk as vips and bring their their partner or bring a friend get all my books for for free in ebook format this sort of stuff so there's a lot you can do there i'd i'd um well i'd encourage both of you to to look into it if you if you haven't done so yes yeah one of, one of the things i use is uh, gofundme is um i've got a um northern ireland veterans campaign that i'm one of the spokesmen for and um one of the things that shy, people shy away from, especially British people, is asking other people for money. Um, but once you get across that barrier and put something up and explain what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, there's a, you know you, you have to promote it, you have to put the information out and update it regularly. Um, but it, it helps. It helps a great deal. And um, you know I've got um, I've got a GoFundMe account that does exactly that. Um, so it stops. You find yourself working on a political campaign and then you're paying for your transport, you're paying for your hotel, you're, you're doing all this work on, on behalf of somebody. But, you know, after a while, you start to think, well, can I afford to keep doing this? But yeah. there's a lot of people that understand that if it's explained well. And the same thing with what you're doing. You, everybody knows how difficult it is to get yourself to the Olympics and, um, uh, and the incredible costs, unless you're one of those spandex people on a Nike advert. You're not going to uh, you're not going to get that same kind of funding. So no. put it up put it up on GoFundMe as well. Mm. Thank you, both. And Robin, thank you so much. We, Robin and I are actually going to have a another chat now. We're going to be talking about the warrior poet. We're also going to be um, looking at doing maybe a, a sneaky top ten or something along these lines. So if you've enjoyed this video, there there'll be a link to a uh, to Robin and my other videos. Um, thank you ever so much, mate. Um, legend as always. Uh, thank you for your commitment as a as a UK veteran. And I feel silly saying this because I'm you're not going anywhere. So, <laughs> Robin, hello. <laughs> yeah, bring, bring us back a medal, Georgie. Yeah, thank, I will do. <laughs> yes, thank you for enlightening us, Robin. Uh, um, as to your, as to your. Uh, incredible career our friends at home massive love to you all as always if you could like and subscribe and support this lonely lowly youtuber it will be much appreciated and we'll see you next time <laughs>